Hello and welcome to the Organic Seedling Production for Small Farms webinar. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Today's webinar will provide an overview of small-scale organic greenhouse management. We wanted to acknowledge that today's webinar is supported through a grant through the USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant Program in collaboration with the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, you can't hear or you can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263, plus zero for the operator, and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Jesse Beckett Parr, and I'll be your host today. I'm the Foundation Director at CCUF. The CCUF Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. Before we get started with the main presentation, I wanted to let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and the control panel at the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event. So let's look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel to not auto hide when inactive if you prefer to keep it always open. The auto, auto, audio pane provides audio information, and by default, you've joined the webinar via mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call, and the dial-in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you can send us questions through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. Throughout the webinar, we'll stop from time to time for questions and answers. And as a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view the recording of today's event, along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. We also have a copy of the PDF PowerPoint slides available for download now through GoToWebinar. Click on the blue file name of the handout in the handouts pane. Due to the size of the PDF files and the beautiful pictures that our presenter provided, there are three PDF files for this webinar labeled by page numbers. A PDF of the slides will open in your internet browser, and you can view them in your browser or download them onto your computer. To expand or collapse the handouts and questions panes, click the triangle next to the name of the pane. For example, if you can't see the box of the questions pane, click on the triangle and it will expand the pane to show the box. We'd like to encourage you now to try to use the questions pane. Let us know where you're calling in from today, and what do you produce or are you planning to produce in your greenhouse? We'll loop back around to the information you send in later in the presentation. Lastly, we have lots of people in the audience today. We will try to respond to as many of the questions and comments as possible. And we apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to your specific question. We encourage you to follow up with us after the webinar with additional questions. Today's presentation will be given by UCSC Farm and Garden Manager, Christoph Bernal. Christoph has been an apprentice instructor since 1999. He has extensive experience in greenhouse and nursery management, propagation, vegetables, and specialty crop flower production. He's especially interested in nutritionally dense crops, small scale grain production, the cultivation of small fruits, and creating a learning growing environment where everyone can thrive. He holds a BA in Asian history from Reed College and an MA in equity and social justice education from San Francisco State University. Welcome, Christoph. Thank you, Jesse. And welcome to everybody out there. Um, we're gonna try to cover quite a bit of ground today. So I will hopefully be able to um, make it through all of this and answer as many questions as possible throughout. Um, and thank you very much for joining us um, and for all of your work that you do to heal the land and feed community. Um, today we are going to cover um, 
basically this outline. We're going to talk in, in relatively brief about using greenhouse infrastructure to advance it, uh, and enhance environmental conditions to promote seedling health. We're also going to look at a number of small scale um, efficiencies, relatively low cost efficiencies that can help um, reduce your labor costs um, and improve the bottom line and ultimately lead to healthier seedlings as well. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about a pest and disease, pest and disease management in the greenhouse setting um, in a more broad sense, and then look at a management template that we use at the UCSC farm as a means for thinking about any particular pest and how we might address issues that are arising, both from a prevention and an intervention standpoint. <clears throat> so first of all, what environmental conditions can one control in the greenhouse setting? Um, and then to what extent do you need to control these? Um, the main things that one would think about are um, management of temperature, and this could be both soil temperature, especially in an ungerminated state, and then also air temperature um, throughout the seedling life cycle. We think um, about air circulation as well because that is the key um, factor in terms of managing for seedling health and pre preventing against diseases such as damping off diseases. Um, soil moisture is a critical factor in, and what that looks like over li life cycle in different crops is a variable and we'll touch on that. Um, <clears throat> and then light is another critical factor to think about managing uh, and provisioning for um, for the vast majority of crops, this is really post-germination and emergence and not so much pre-germination. Um, so we won't get in too much into like things around um, supplemental lighting through metal halide or any of the other possible lighting sources. Thanks so much for everybody for trying the questions, Kane. So we have folks coming calling from San Jose, California, Newcastle, Indiana, Ojai, California, Galt, and folks are interested in vegetable transplants as well as annual and perennial foods and native plant transplants. And um, we have some folks calling in who are growing diversified vegetables, strawberries, and flowers. Nice. Nice. Well, today, so we're definitely going to talk about transplant production. The emphasis here will certainly be on annuals. Um, However, the practices and techniques that we're going to cover are very broadly applicable um, to a variety of crops and a variety of locations. One thing I should mention in terms of the degree to which environmental management and then infrastructure, which I'm going to go into here, the degree to which you need to have um, infrastructure in your system is really dependent on several different things. It's dependent first and foremost on the crops and the environmental and cultural needs that the crops that you're growing have. And then it is also dependent on the environmental conditions that your site presents and to the extent to which they either do line up with your crop needs or where you need to think about um, altering and managing the environment to better suit um, the needs of the crops. And this is particularly important in the germination and early seedling development stage. As crops t uh, mature, even in, even in the seedling stage, um, you tend to have much wider environmental tolerance um, and temperature thresholds and such where they will really prosper. Um, so I want to just talk briefly about um, how greenhouse structures um, give you as a grower the ability to manage environmental conditions and, and optimize development. And there's really two principal plat, um, categories or arenas um, in terms of greenhouse infrastructure. One is what are referred to as passive means, things that which is built into the design of the structure. Um, and that could simply be your venting system, things like thermal mass within your uh, facility. Um, and then there are um, active environmental controls and those are things that are usually energy dependent, that could be electricity or gas, um, but that then provide you significantly more capacity for managing the environmental conditions more tightly, but obviously come at a higher cost, both environmentally as well as the actual capital investment to develop these, these portions of the facilities. Um, in terms of how we think about managing uh, 
temperature. In passive facilities, this is really a matter of just bringing in, placing your facility in a location that's going to have good access to sunlight, and then that sunlight is captured within the structure as solar radiation, and then that heats the air within. Um, and then we think about using um, air circulation and air movement, bringing outside air in, typically cooler outside air into the greenhouse that is um, going to promote cooling and, and keeping temperatures from getting too hot. There's obviously limitations to this, though. If it is 90 degrees in your greenhouse and it's 80 degrees outside, that 80 degree air is going to have not much impact on bringing temperatures down within. And that's sometimes where active means um, are more uh, more necessary depending on your crops and climate. So active active heating and cooling could be things like gas unit heaters. Um, it could be radiant floor heating in a more ex extensive structure. Um, cooling often happens in the form of pad and fan coolers or swamp coolers. Um, a certain amount of cooling can also happen simply through um, mechanical exhaust fans as well. Um, air circulation is sort of part and parcel with heating and cooling. Um, passive air circulation is basically things like ridge vents, end wall vents, side vents, could be roll up curtains or drop down curtains um, on the side walls that allow for air to move from the outside into the facility and then back out of the facility. Um, Active air circulation comes through things such as exhaust fans and half or horizontal airflow fans um, that, that um, use mechanics to actually move air around. The horizontal airflow fans are particularly useful because those can be run even when you have your green, greenhouses completely closed up because you're trying to maximize the, the temperature, uh, temperature warming uh, potential of the sun um, because they are just pushing and circulating air within and rather than bringing outside air into the environment. But even that can be very, very valuable in working against uh, the presence of damping off organisms. Um, water delivery, obviously we're not going to be rained upon in a greenhouse, so water delivery could come by hand and be completely something that you, that you do um, based on your own in knowledge and intuition about what your crops need at any particular time. It might also come through a variety of automated methods. Um, simple irrigation controllers, which we'll look at later, that can be programmed to meet environmental and crop needs, or more sophisticated equipment that actually has environmental sensors within your greenhouse and moisture uh, probes within your soil mixes to determine when to deliver water based on the set points that you have established. Um, and then finally, light. Light infiltration, um, it's our source of heating, but it's also the source of photosynthesis and subsequent development once crops are growing. So this is in part dependent on the actual location of the crop, of your greenhouse, trying to make sure it is not sitting in close proximity to tall buildings that might cast shade or trees that might cast shade. Or even, you know, a problem that we face at the UCSC greenhouse is there are trees that 30 years ago were very small and that are now casting substantial shade on our structures. And that, you know, means that we either have to adapt our growing practices or more likely spend money to cut those trees down. So thinking long term about what is in proximity to where your growing environment is, is going to be really critical. Um, and then we won't really get much into this, but if for some growers and in particularly growing crops out of season in the winter during short days, supplemental lighting such as LED and metal, metal halide lights and so forth may be a really critical tool for both for seedlings, but also if you were using greenhouses to grow to full maturity. Um, so let me step into just talking a little bit about environmental management across life stages. Um, when we think of um, seedling development, when we first sow our seeds um, and we, and then water in the seeds in the, in the soil, um, the seeds will imbibe moisture, begin their internal metabolic processes, and then the root radical will push down and into the soil. Most of us don't think about 
germination actually happening until emergence happens, until the, the cotyledons push above the soil, um, though technically it has actually started quite a bit before that. Um, in this pre-germination and uh, just germinated stage, typically we're thinking about um, kind of the narrowest window of temperature management um, at this life um, at this point in time really trying to target the optimal temperature range for your crops is important the maximum or the minimum is typically going to mean either much much slower germination and, and emergence or um, possibly lower percentages of germination if you get into issues like thermodormancy and such if the conditions are too hot for certain crops um, we also think about water management here. Um, generally during emergence or, and, and pre -emer before crops have germinated and during emergence, uh, we would like to be able to provide steady and consistent water, but in relatively low volumes because they need water, but not at huge volumes because there isn't much plant mass yet. When um, they continue to develop, um, the, our water ma management will change slightly, but we really think about fairly low level constant moisture in the ungerminated and just germinating stage. There are some exceptions, larger seeded crops, if you were doing things like sunflowers and cucurbits. If you don't have at least a moderate wet to dry swing, you may really encourage the presence of damping off organisms that love those crops and could um, kill your crops before they've really made any headway. Um, the other um, thing to think about is that our mix, our soil mix definitely needs to be well aerated um, to manage environmental conditions. Just a note for those of you who called in via your phone, uh, a couple of you are not muted. If you called in via your computer, you are muted automatically, but if you're called in via your phone, you're not muted and we can hear you. So please mute yourself. Nice. Um, okay, just moving slightly forward in terms of life development. Um, once you have gotten past the cotyledon stage and the root system and the leaf canopy is starting to develop and, and expand, um, then we're really thinking about more water, a greater volume All right, sorry about that. In my attempt to mute whoever was doing some heavy breathing on their side, I managed to mute us. So <laughs> we're gonna keep going. Yeah. Thanks to everybody who let us know that the sound stopped. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna back, back up a little bit to this slide just because um, I said a couple relevant things here that many of you probably missed or maybe everyone missed. Um, once we are past germination stage and we're beginning to develop our leaf canopy and root system, um, then, Moisture management is really about more water, more volume of water on a slightly less frequent schedule um, because as the root system develops and expands and is, is filling out the root zone, then clearly more water is gonna be needed to support that development and support the canopy development. Sunlight is gonna be critical throughout. We don't love the shade that's being casted on, as you can see in this photo, because that can make for uneven growth. Um, and then air circulation, always critical to manage against uh, damping off organisms. And then finally, temperature tends, the temperature range that's ideal for your crops tends to widen or open slightly at this point because the most critical stage is really in germination. Um, this, is a great, this is a great time for those of you all who have questions, who would like to write them in. You can use the question function just like we did before. And if you have general questions for Christoph, please do send them in now and we'll get them answered. 
Um, so as we move towards seedling maturation, um, we really want to think about um, taking our seedlings, and here in this image, they're still in the greenhouse, but they're basically at the point where they are ready to move outside. Um, so we really want to think about moving our seedlings um, from the more controlled environment of our greenhouse, whatever the facilities are that you have, to the outdoor environment that they will eventually end up in. Usually this translates as benches or tables outside near your greenhouse, but ultimately where they're going to be exposed to environmental conditions that are very similar to the in-ground conditions that they will experience once transplanted. Um, this process of hardening off um, is what it's typically referred to, or sometimes just acclimatization, is about a couple of things in particular. It's about full exposure to day-night temperature fluctuation, which helps to build carbohydrate reserves and give the plant some of the resources that they'll need to handle transplant when they're possibly going through a little bit of uh, a shock or surprise. Um, and then also the exposure to full exposure to the sun and the wind helps to really strengthen cell walls, strengthening, bringing some rigidity to the stems and the leaves so that they'll better be able to tolerate environmental conditions. Um, and the more significant the difference is between your more controlled indoor conditions and your outdoor conditions, the more important thinking about a gradual hardening off process for the vast majority of crops really is. And we typically think of uh, a minimum of a two, three day for kind of cool season crops up to a week plus for warm season crops uh, where they're gonna spend some time still in the greenhouse and area but outside before they get put in the um, put in the ground. Um, what do mature seedlings or transplants actually look like? Um, well this image is a little bit um, not optimal because I would actually call those plants just slightly root bound there um, but Essentially, when we're thinking about the qualities of a mature transplant, they should have gone through this process of hardening off. Um, they should have a reasonable balance of root and shoot development, and that's obviously going to be different from crop to crop, but a reasonable balance of root and shoot development. The root ball itself, um, we like to think of uh, a term that we refer to as root knit, like K-N-I-T, where the root system itself knits and holds the soil ball together so that when you take them out of the containers, the soil isn't just going to slough off and possibly pull roots off with them. But so you have root knit that holds the root ball together. And then finally, typically at least two to maybe four sets of true leaves um, is what most seedlings look like. Um, and that, um, but again, it's, there's a lot of crop specifics there. Um, these plants here more or less represent that, except that I'd say they're a little bit root bound. If you look at the bottom of that image, you'll see they look like they're spiraling a little bit. And that's actually because of the particular trays that they were in that don't have kind of the capacity to um, what we call air prune the roots and, and then cause branching up above. Instead, they hit the bottom because it's a flat bottom and they just spun around. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about what we would refer to as holding strategies and when you might let go of some seedlings if uh, you're just not getting them transplanted in a, in a timely fashion. Um, holding strategies are something you might need to think about employing when perhaps early season your ground's still wet and cold, you're not able to get your, your fields prepared to receive those seedlings and yet your sowing schedule is marching forward. So what can we do to keep our plants in prime condition um, a little bit longer? Um, one is certainly exposing your crops to cooler growing conditions will slow their growth down. So if you can, for example, anticipate a late plant out date, maybe you move your seedlings out of the greenhouse earlier than you otherwise would have to slow them down a little bit earlier. Um, sometimes folks will actually try to put them in a more of a shady location where they're getting less sunlight exposure and that can work but you have to be careful that you don't give them too much shade because they're going to stretch out and get leggy if they're in the shade for too long um, or partial shade for too long. 
Um, another thing that people commonly use is thinking about su supplying some sort of supplemental or soluble liquid fertility um, so that even as the nutrients that are in the soil zone start to get exhausted by the crop, they still have access to readily available nutrients that you're supplying as, as supplemental fertility. Um, and then finally, what some folks will do but is really maybe only practical on a really small scale is to actually pot up or bump your seedlings on into a larger size cell or container so as to be able to maintain steady and uninterrupted growth and access to resources. Great idea, but also much, uh, much time and labor involved in that. So not always the most practical. So just before we head on, we did get a couple of questions in. Uh, so Ronald writes in that he grows up quite a bit of transplants, cabbage, onion, cucurbits, and that he has a hard time getting a good root ball. What could be the limiting factor? Light? Question mark? Fertilizer? So that's a great question and, and something that a lot of people encounter. And most likely it, your, your mix and or any supplemental fertility that you're um, supplying is a little bit out of balance, perhaps with an excess of uh, nitrogen and um, not enough phosphorus and potassium in the soil to really promote good root growth. That's one thing that could be a factor. Another factor could simply be that your mix either doesn't hold enough water or it holds too much water, doesn't have good aeration, and is not promoting good healthy root growth. So I would really look at, look first of all, at kind of the structure texture of your mix and then also how you're provisioning for, t for fertility and see if um, you could make some easy changes there. Another question from David White is, do you all use liquid food for your transplants? And if so, what are you using? Um, I will, we're going to cover, I'm actually going to talk specifically about supplemental fertility a little bit later, so I will get into greater depth, but the basic answer is yes, we did. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just want to touch briefly on um, when to cut loose. Is there a point at which you might want to just let go of some seedlings um, because perhaps they're just not going to perform very well because they've stayed in the greenhouse area too long, they're stressed out, um, and are going to not give you good crop performance? Um, that's always a tough thing to think about when you've put time and energy into a crop, um, but I would say there are some crops that are more sensitive to stress and, con and containment or confinement. Um, all of the heading brassicas, think cabbage, or it's cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, cauliflower in particular, um, tends to be more sensitive to that kind of confinement stress and may then lead to smaller heads and inconsistent head size and so forth. The same is also true if you happen to be doing cucurbits from transplant. Um, they have a very, very large extensive root system and that um, root system does not want to be held back in containers for any length of time. So the heading brassicas, the cucurbits, and most of our cut flowers as well, we really think about trying to prioritize getting them in the ground sooner rather than later. Sunflowers as an example. is. A, if they're left in a container for too long, they will what we call button up, where they'll start to form a flower bud when they're only a couple of inches tall, and then they're not going to be that four foot tall, five foot tall sunflower um, that you were going to cut to sell as a single stem bunch. So prioritizing the crops that um, are most sensitive is critical, and then letting go at a certain point is critical too. Um, yeah, let me move on from there. So just as a kind of quick recap to think about some of the kind of critical factors in terms of seedling health, um, somehow through our greenhouse facilities and the mix of crops that we're going to grow, we're going to try to align our capacity to manage environmental conditions um, with the crops that we're growing and the, and the climate or environment that we're in. Um, we're going to um, want to make sure that we have a soil mix that is well drained, well aerated, but also holds moisture adequately, and then either has fertility in it at, through compost or other, you know, uh, nutrient byproducts, or that we're going to supply in a liquid or uh, kind of supplemental manner. And I'm going to go more into soils in just a moment here. 
Um, we want to think about scheduling and delivering irrigation in the appropriate quantities across the life cycle. Smaller volumes uh, more frequently early, larger volumes less frequently, um, and then consistent and uniform uh, across all of our crops as we're going to. We want to know when our seedlings are mature and, and then move them through our cycle and harden off at the appropriate time. And then through our crop planning, through our field preparation and such, we really want to make sure that we get plants planted out in a timely fashion that's going to help ensure the ultimate success, the harvest success of our crop. Um, and then if that's not always going to work out, then we're going to think about how do we hold and keep them happy longer. And finally, um, I haven't said anything about pests and disease management very little yet, but we'll, the last few slides are going to touch largely on uh, thinking about pest and disease management. Um, now I just want to jump into some things um, that you might want to look at in your overall system in terms of thinking about how to make for a more efficient system. Um, and that efficiency, I think, as I said at the outset, both is to reduce time and labor, but really um, is about crop quality as well and, and having consistent high quality seedlings as part of your uh, as the outcome of all of your efforts. So <clears throat> first and foremost, I think a little bit about workspace design and movement and handling of materials. Um, if you've ever read the book called The Lean Farm, um, the central focus of that is how do I limit the repetition of motion and kind of excess movement of, of people and materials. And so um, whether you have a greenhouse set up as it already is or you're starting from scratch, I would really encourage you to think about what's the most efficient flow of materials, be that soils, compost, fertility, um, to your greenhouse facility. How do your containers, your soil mix, how does the, what's the flow of how you actually fill those containers with your soil mix and then sow the seeds and ultimately move them into the greenhouse and then outside. The more sort of linear or circular that you can de design your systems, um, the less sort of uh, wasted motion or ed energy you may experience. Whereas if you have kind of a noodle-like setup where you're moving left and then moving right and backwards and forwards, um, in any one moment, it may not seem like that's taking up much time, but if you think about the thousands and thousands of uh, times you're gonna go through those same motions over the course of a season, that amount of time can really, really add up. So thinking about um, workspace design and, and uh, energy flow, I would say is a really critical starting point or reflection point if you're already, you know, if you're already midstream. Um, we're, um, you might also really want to consider, um, and I'm going to talk about this next, so do we want to make our own mixes, custom make our own mixes, or do I have access um, to good soil resources that are already made that I can just purchase in? And, and in many cases, I'd say purchasing in is going to be a more efficient, not always preferable, but usually a more efficient method. Um, we're going to talk about containers and how what kind of containers you might want to grow, and then um, sowing methods, how to increase your sowing method through things like using vacuum seeders. Um, I'm going to touch on germination chambers as an efficiency tool, um, and then kind of bench space and layout, which kind of really touches back on containers. Irrigation delivery, uh, and how to streamline our time and effort and improve crop quality there. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll get into crop uh, we'll get into supplemental fertility. Um, the yellow text here may be a little hard for folks to read, but hopefully this will be clear, clear enough. So if you're thinking about making your own mixes, I would say there's some substantial advantages. Um, one, you have complete control over the inputs, over all of the ingredients that go into your mixes. Um, and you can control structure, texture, fertility inputs. Um, if sustainability in the ingredients is a high priority to you, you certainly can make informed choices there as well, which can be harder to do when you're purchasing in a mix. Um, 
And then while this gets into maybe more specialized operations, if you were growing large, large volumes of a particular crop, it might make sense to have specialized mixes for a particular crop to really um, line up the qualities of that mix with the, the specific needs of a crop. Most of the time in diversified operations, you need to really find a mix, a single mix that's going to work for everything. But, but depending on your scale, you may have specialized mixes as well. Um, we can make, if we're making our own mix, we can make as much or as little as we need at a, at a given time. And then we can also um, really think about balancing soil moisture before actually sowing. So there will be what the plants need right from the start. There are some disadvantages too to making your own mixes. One, you've got to stockpile all of the different raw ingredients that are in your mix um, and then store your finished mix as well. You need to know a bit about basic chemistry to balance pH and uh, nutrient levels within your mix. Um, and that process can sometimes be a little bit imprecise um, and could, but if you're willing to spend some time and energy both testing uh, your soil mixes in-house as well as perhaps sending them out to a soils lab to get um, some some data feedback on what your mixes are like, then maybe mixing in-house is really is the way to go. But lastly, I think the biggest challenge is just really the time and labor that it takes to make your own mixes. This is where your probably your highest cost is going to be is thinking about the time and labor to make your own mixes. Um, and I should say that after sort of full disclosure, we have been making our own mixes at the UCSC farm for 45 plus years um, and training folks on how to do so. And then ultimately we really discovered that the vast majority of our um, participants, our uh, graduates go out and buy in mixes because they just don't have the time and the labor resources to actually make mixes themselves. So then the question is, can you find a high quality mix that's gonna meet your needs if you're gonna purchase them in? Um, some advantages to doing so is that they certainly do exist out there um, where, you know, professional soil makers have optimized texture, pH, and in some cases, nutrients. Um, this is an important label reading exercise that a lot of the mixes that are out there that are especially seed germinating mixes don't have any fertility in them. And so you're going to have to think about um, providing either blending in dry ingredients to provide some of that fertility or providing liquid fertility further down the road um, post germination. Um, you also don't have to stockpile lots of different materials. You would just have your finished mix, presumably. Um, so there's a giant time and labor savings in all of this. Um, you'll notice in the left hand column I say cost can be low and then the right hand column I believe it says cost can be really high. Um, that just depends on the volume that you're purchasing and your sourcing and so forth. So buying in mixes can be cheap, especially if you're buying in like the these, those are 55 cubic foot totes on the right and those pallets in the right hand image fairly in, inexpensive. If you're buying 3.8 compressed cubic 3.8 cubic foot bales, um, that can be much more expensive. Um, one other thing I'll note just between like compressed bales and loose fill bales, um, the compressed bales take a lot of time and energy to um, actually break apart. If you look in the top right image going back here, that's some cocoa peat or choir, and those bales are literally like bricks, and you've got to soak them and there, if you look in the picture, you'll see some hammers there. They use the claw part to try to break them apart. Your typical bag mix isn't going to be quite that dense, but even so, it can take some effort to, to separate them out. Um, yeah, and then as I mentioned, just you want to look closely. Does this mix provide me fertility or am I going to have to think about other means of getting there? Um, if you are buying in these large totes, then you need a forklift to be able to move them around, whether that's, you know, an, a dedicated forklift or um, fork attachments on a bucket of a tractor. You can also chain, use a chain and because they have fairly strong handles and use um, just hooks on your bucket um, and a chain to move those big totes around, but that's a little bit unwieldy. So anyway, some some equipment required to handle those larger volumes. Um, another thing to just be aware of is that, and I'd say this left-hand image here illustrates this, 
any mix, a mix you make on your own or a purchased in mix, um, when it dries out, um, peat and cocoa peat, which are often the primary ingredients in mixes, um, those can become very, very hydrophobic and repel water for some time before they actually absorb water. So you really want to think about um, trying to manage moisture and not over, not let them get too dry because then they're going to be hard to re-moisten. So we've gotten a bunch of great questions and we're going to kind of hold those to the end because we're a little bit behind schedule and I want to be cognizant of folks' this time. We have about 20 minutes till the end of the webinar. If we yeah. don't get to your questions, we'll make sure that Christoph answers them after the webinar. Yeah. But just to thank you for writing in and we do see them. Yes. Um, so just briefly on containers, there is a myriad of container types out there. Um, at this point in time, we are using then the bottom left corner, the injected molded polypropylene containers, those are the hard plastic rigid containers. Um, we really like them because they, while their initial cost can be anywhere from five to $10 each, depending on the volume that you're buying, they have a theoretically indefinite lifespan. They're virtually indestructible. Um, the polyethylene containers, um, they um, are much, much less expensive. They can be 50 cents each, but they have a fairly short lifespan. Um, and then finally, the polystyrene, the styrofoam speedlings, which really was the, the revolution in terms of growing plants in cell type containers. Um, as a growing environment, they're great, though they tend to get damaged over time fairly quickly, and then they can be a harbor for pathogens and so forth in the cells themselves. So we have moved away largely from using those polystyrene containers just because we like the sort of durability and the cleanability of the polypropylene containers. One other key thing I should just mention is the speedling containers and the poly hard plastic containers, they typically are in what's referred to as a 1326 format. It's 13 inches by 26 inches. Um, so your facilities need to sort of work with that. Whereas the polyethylene containers are in a 1020 format, 10 inches by 20 inches. Um, and this is relevant because um, we, I typically think of greenhouse space as very kind of precious ground, um, sort of prime real estate, and we really want to maximize the use of our bench space. So if you look at these photos here, it's a little bit hard to see, but we've got a mix of wooden flats that are 12 by 18 inches. We've got 17 inch square trays. We've got 1020 trays. Um, and then we've also got 13, 26 inch trays. And there's a lot of little gaps and sort of lost space on the tabletop there. There's also four or five different cell sizes here. Um, and so each of these plants needs a little bit different amount of water relative to the amount of soil that they have. And having this kind of jumble and mix makes it much harder for you as a grower to really um, optimally meet um, the water delivery needs of the, of the crops that you're growing. And if you look in the right-hand photo, you'll see there's actually quite a range of ages of plants as well. And even if they were all in the same cell size, at such different ages, they have really different water needs. So what I would encourage you to think about to the extent possible is um, uniformity and consistency. In these two photos, the one on the left is all 1020 trays and there's only two cell sizes. The one on the right is all 1326 trays and there's only one cell size. The difference you see in crop maturity actually in that photo happens to be because it's from a soil trial with vastly different fertility inputs in each of those trays. But, but in terms of delivering water, um, they're much easier. And then there's almost no wasted bench space. The, the space in the photo on the left, I would just say, is yet unused but not wasted um, bench space because more 10, 20 trays will fit nicely in there shortly. So that's a kind of a space and kind of uh, environmental management efficiency factor that can, can be really helpful for you. Um, jumping back to containers, I'm going to move to seed sowing here. Um, you can purchase or you could very easily make what uh, we call dibbler boards or plug poppers. These ones really is kind of dual purpose. Um, one built for our 162 cells and one built for our 242 cells. And all we did was lay out a template based on the trays so that 
we could, um, in one quick motion, we could readily dibble all of the cells uniformly and consistently um, instead of, say, using our fingers to poke little indentations in every single cell. Regardless of the containers you're working with, if you have don't have too many different options running at once, having a tool like this can save you a ton of time. Um, another thing to think about in this department is vacuum seeders. Probably not a worthy investment if you don't do large volumes of crops, but if you are doing relatively large volumes of crops, even of five containers of the same crop at once, this can be a huge time savings. This vacuum seeder happens to cost about $2,500. Um, but two people can be sewing trays at a, in about a minute and a half um, per tray with 242 cells after you've already filled and dibbled them. One person is feeding the trays, one person is seeding, and then the same person who's feeding the trays is also receiving the trays. Um, and the seeding motion is really quick and easy. The, you have a large volume of seeds on that blue plate with holes drilled perfectly for your cells and the seed size. Um, you roll it back and forth, seeds land in every hole, you tip it over, you release the vacuum, the seeds drop, you take the next batch of seeds that were held in that little reservoir in the top, sort of that top darker blue bar, um, and do it again and again and again. Um, in our time trial studies, this um, roughly five times the speed of sewing by hand. Um, depending on the crops. The one key thing to note is vacuum seeders are really most effective with round seeds like brassicas and pelleted seed, um, and not nearly as efficient when you get into, um, when you get into irregularly shaped seeds like say peppers and tomatoes, though still faster, but not nearly, not as exponentially faster. Um, just to give you a sense, of the, um, one could build something like this very easily too. This is Jason from Hidden Villa, and he's got about $50 worth of materials there, a wooden box, a metal plate drilled to the cell sizes, and then a real small shop vacuum. Um, and this particular seeder um, is also seeding at a very, very fast rate. Um, dumps the seeds on, rolls them around with the vacuum on, um, pours off the excess, tips the tray, tips the cedar over the tray, cuts the vacuum, seeds drop, repeat the process. And I should note too, in this video, he actually, instead of having made a dibbler, he just uses nesting style trays of the same cell size to create his dibbles in, in those. Um, so just using something you already have rather than having to build something anew. Um, Germination chambers, this is another way to really think about maximizing um, your use of space because you're now using vertical space um, and also really only heating a small area. So this is just an old metro rack re repurposed and then some old greenhouse plastic repurposed to create um, a growing environment. At the bottom in the right there, you'll see there's a small little stock tank um, that's like a 10 gallon stock tank, um, a water source and a, a float valve to keep the tank full. And then there's a small heating element in that. And when the quote unquote door is closed, you are basically creating a consistently warm and humid environment so that when you put in water trays, you don't really have to water at all again until they've germinated. Um, Germination chambers greatly speed up germination and increase your percentage of germination, thus reducing your crop time, reducing the amount of seed you're going to have to use. Um, off the shelf, one of these could cost a couple thousand dollars. Um, a unit like this DIY unit here um, is not even a couple hundred dollars worth of materials. I, I would say a really, really worthy investment um, to any greenhouse operation. One caveat is that if you leave things in a germination chamber too long, they will tend to really um, stretch out. This was actually from a solid sided one where there was no sunlight, but the seedlings on the left um, are only about a day post germination and they are already stretched out. And the ones in the image on the 
right are about three days post-germination. That happens to be lettuce, and I would call that tree lettuce, which is not a very useful crop um, for us. And basically, those are worthless at this point. So um, you really have, there's a little bit of a learning curve to knit, learn what your new germination rates are like compared to your what you have anticipated in your greenhouse and then really, really be on top of timing of moving things out just when germination begins. Um, so water delivery by hand is a time and labor intensive thing. It's also a knowledge intensive thing, but allows you to really meet crop needs if you are skilled at what you're doing. In the image on the right, there's a, what's called the high hose system. That's a really nice way to move your hose up and down the length of your greenhouse without dragging it on the floor, um, without potentially, um, potentially exposing it to pathogens and such. So that's one way to increase by hand water efficiency. Um, one thing to be aware of, if you have less experienced waters, you will sometimes get people um, who say they've watered, but if you look at that image on the left, I think you can see there's only water to about the top half of that cell and the bottom half is really dry. Um, to some of the person's question earlier on about why am I not getting root development? It could also, sometimes it could be that you're not watering deep enough. In this image, I think most of the time it did get enough water and thus there's roots down below, but if there was no water there, there would be no roots there. Um, I would definitely consider or encourage you to consider some form of watering automation um, if you want to save time. Um, this is their Netafim um, nozzles over all of our benches here. A little bit of time and energy to set up this controller and the solenoid valves that are on the left in the bottom left picture there. Um, but once it's set up, immense labor savings. We have to program it to meet crops' needs. We need to make sure we block and organize our crops um, in fairly consistent blocks so that we can deliver the right amount of water. But um, once it's set up, um, the amount of time we're spending wa watering is very, very small. A little bit of touch up here and there but not multiple trips to the greenhouse spending, you know, a house of this size to water the whole thing. If it's full, could be a half an hour of my time as opposed to checking up on it and spending just a couple minutes spot watering um, in any areas that maybe are drying faster. So great potential to save yourself a lot of time and energy once you set up the infrastructure. Um, just to touch briefly on supplemental fertility. Um, why do you think you might need supplemental fertility? Well, maybe the mix that you purchased doesn't have any fertility in it. So post-germination, supplemental fertility is gonna be critical. Um, maybe the mix you made or thought was more fertile, maybe it was a poor batch of compost that you were using and it's not delivering what the plants need. Um, you might also wanna speed, plant, speed the growth of plants up because you have an earlier plant out date than you had anticipated or as we talked about, this can be a really valuable tool for holding as well. Um, the question came up earlier about what materials. Um, we at UCSC Farm, we typically used either plant extracts or um, fish, uh, fish emulsion type products. Um, and there are many, many different ones on the market. It's kind of a question of what is available in your area because the uh, you know like we buy them in five gallon pails and the shipping is the most expensive part it's more expensive than the materials sometimes so trying to find a local resource of a material that you can really trust and it'd be worth buying in smaller quantities and then trialing different ones side by side before you make a bigger financial commitment um, we really like um, AgriThrive, for example, but it's just one of many and they happen to be readily ac accessible in, in our area. Um, might also think, do I need to think about kelp or something like that as a micronutrient resource um, that could easily be um, put in solution and then injected in your system. And well, for the sake of time, I'm not going to really talk about modes of delivery. Um, so briefly on pests and disease management, I would say first and foremost, really want to think about how do we prevent pest issues in the first place. Um, and that I would say comes by way of good cultural practices, trying to manage water and temperature, having a soil mix that allows you to manage water properly. Um, 
good sanitation throughout your facility, starting with clean seeds, starting with a pathogen-free mix, um, not leaving hoses on the ground, things of that nature, cleaning tools, a thorough annual cleaning of your greenhouses. As you start to get, these are concrete floors in this image, but there's a lot of soil debris there. Weeds are starting to grow. Those can sometimes be a host for pest species. Um, if you get a lot of organic matter building up on the on the ground, even in a concrete greenhouse, that can then be an alternate uh, substrate for fungus gnats and other pest species. So um, a clean growing environment is really critical. We also really want to think about monitoring and detection. Monitoring comes principally through things like yellow sticky traps um, or blue traps, depending on the pests you might be trying to monitor for, um, and regularly walking and inspecting your crops. You know, really just kind of standard IPM procedures, um, I would say, are critical in your greenhouse, combined with your cultural practices. We also, I should also mention in our mixes, we mix in a beneficial trichoderma fungus to help prevent against damping off. It is a great resource, but it's really just an addition to good cultural practices. Um, if we had poor cultural practices, the, the trichoderma fungus is not going to help us out adequately. It it's really starts with your sound practices. Um, and then finally, if you determine that you do have a problem, uh, what, is, what tools, what treatment strategies might I want to use? Um, and certainly going to the CCOF website and doing a material search um, to make sure what you're after is, a, is an appropriate organic and acceptable ingredient. That's, that's critical in getting that on your certified lists or your OSP before you use it. It's also important. But, um, we think about treatment and intervention as kind of a last resource, but at the same time, we want to do it as quickly as possible because the sooner we can intervene, the more likely we're going to be able to be successful at, um, at actually halting pest problems. So I mentioned that I was going to talk about a, a template, and without getting into all of the details here, I just want to say, you know, so pest species, we need to think about identification of who we're dealing with. Who, who is this pest and am I certain that I've got proper identification? And that's where a lot of on, online resources and hand lens and so forth can be really helpful. Um, causes, what are the environmental conditions that might um, promote this particular pest or invite them? And, and then how can I think about changing that? What are signs of damage, um, and, uh, whether that's above or below ground? And then what preventative tools might I have or be able to employ or enhance changing cultural practices, for example, more or less water? Um, how much tolerance do I have for any pest damage? Um, none, a little, a lot. Um, and then what are the kind of intervention tools that might um, help me? And there's a lot of good resources out on the, on the web and through the Atra site and so forth. But also then what other crops might be susceptible so that I'm paying close attention to them. So this is that same template with a lot of information about fungus gnats. Um, and ultimately here, I actually want to just point to the background images. Fungus gnats are um, a significant pest that can do a lot of damage to your crops and, and really um, stunt your crops. The fungus gnat and the shore fly um, appear in huge numbers under similar environmental conditions. The shore fly is really just a nuisance that you maybe don't have to do anything about, but the fungus gnat is something that could be a big problem for you, so proper identification is key. Um, and yeah, you can look more closely at kind of the details of that, and I think we're going to move to some final questions and so forth, or is there any time for that? No, so Christoph does have some greenhouse propagation resources available. They're up on the slide. They're also in the PDF. Yeah. Um, we're not going to have question and answer, unfortunately, because we're at the end of our time. So for those of you who did write in questions, I will give them to Christoph, and hopefully he can connect with you via email for your specific questions. There is an organic seedling production field day at the UCSA Farm and Garden on March 25th. For any of you all in driving distance of Santa Cruz, California, we would love to have you. And then also you should be on the lookout for their free seedling grower guide that's going to be out in English and Spanish in June of 2020. Yeah. So thank you for attending. We hope you found the, use, the webinar useful. You'll receive an email after this webinar with an evaluation link 
please fill out the evaluation form. It helps us improve our educational offerings and get ideas for future trainings and grants. And really, we fund these free webinars through grants. And so if we can say, oh, these are the people that came, this is what they found useful, and not that helps us uh, get additional funding to put on this type of free event in the future. Please note that the evaluations are not anonymous, but we value all kinds of feedback, including ways that we can improve. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.